happened. Um, whatever supports you. So today I was going to talk about um, tenderness, tenderhearted. And uh, when I Googled tender and the Buddha, I found that there is a Buddha chocolate bar that is part of a tender loving empire. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know that there's probably a chocolate empire out there in very many ways, but it was interesting to me that the Buddha and Tender came up with a chocolate bar. So for some of you, that may be something that's tender and for others, it may be an uh, indication of consumerism and whatnot. So, um, I heard on the uh, in the introductions when people were sharing about um, what is making you feel tenderhearted these days. This way that our heart is moved, you know, the heart is moved by what is happening in the world. And one of the definitions of tenderhearted is easily moved to love. Easily moved to love. And so, you know, some of, some people are mentioning nature, you know, friends. And so that could really, you can really understand how the heart can move there. And also a lot of times in Buddhist practice, when we think of the heart moving, we think about compassion. And so that also came up in the you know, sharing people who have cancer, pain, suicide, the impact of addiction, in our families, you know, suffering on the worldwide level and the compassionate heart that is moved by all that we experience. And I find for me as a, as a queer person, I have had a lot of practice in building up walls and barriers and shields and armor and all sorts of uh, barriers to protect myself over time to survive. And that you know, we were talking about earlier on, we were talking about reaching middle age and I'm 59 and I didn't ever think I would live this long. And I think about the many friends I know who haven't lived this long and that we have survived has been because of all of our strategies of survival. And I wanna encourage us as part of our survival, resilience, well-being strategy that we bring in a sense of tenderness, that we bring in this ability to feel, to allow ourselves to be moved by love, Years and years ago, a friend of mine said to me, because she knew was very well that this was my strategy of not feeling, like that I just had the strategy of just not feeling in the world because it just felt like if I felt, I would just feel too much. And she had a lot of things going on in the 80s, her, her her father was one of the first people that I knew who had contracted HIV and AIDS and subsequently died of it. And I was always so impressed with her because she felt, she felt the impact of her life. She allowed herself to be touched. And it was one of the things that was really, it's been something that I feel like as I have continued with my Buddhist practice, that it's, I've gotten a better understanding that that my life is not about avoiding pain, avoiding suffering. That my life is about meeting this moment as best as I can with all of the capacity and kindness that I can muster. And so as I thought more about this, a couple of things come to my mind. And one is my background in, in uh, ecology and study on environmental studies and whatnot in that 
homeostasis in an ecosystem, which is when there, things are in balance, is not a flat line, that it kind of goes around an area. So, you know, for example, if there are a lot of acorns one year, then there's a lot of mice, and then the acorns go down, and the mice population. And then, you know, likewise with all of the other myriad conditions in a system, that it's not static. And then the other thing is I came thinking about more about this flow of how we engage with the world through this flow of meeting is the image of a flat line in a hospital. Because I had always thought like, I want to just be cool, you know, like the flat line in a hospital means that your heart isn't beating. And if we look to the natural world, we see these images of, of flow, of waves, in so many ways, not just the ocean, which is the most visible one, but our sound waves are all of these waves that we're actually embedded in. The breath, the flow of the breath, all of these flows. And yet there can be a way that each of us can think that we are static, that we are here and this is the way it is. And the non-reactivity is what we're hoping for. And that is sometimes some of the things that are spoken in, in Buddhism is non-reactivity. And I think it is, and sometimes it is good to feel non-reactive in terms of not being like, oh, you know, or oh, we're like, you know, sometimes that's great. And sometimes you can see somebody can be like, okay. My housemate, um, my beloved family member was very reactive this morning when she found out that my other housemate, her son, who's 15, was had been calling Italy and had a $1,500 phone bill. <laughs> there was a lot of reactivity. And when I, she, when I left the house and when I came back later, she was all like, oh, I felt so badly. And I was like, that seems like a thing that you might react to. And, you know, it wasn't intentional. He didn't realize. But still, you know, if you had any interaction in families, you know that things can really go up and down. And I think that's okay. You know, this sense of this flow and sometimes it's bigger than others. And yet there is a way that with our mindfulness practice that we can create some spaciousness around meeting the moment. And for me, one of the areas of spaciousness is bringing love to the minute, to the moment, to this situation. And so oftentimes for me, when I think of mindfulness, I don't actually think of it as distinct from metta. That I think of it as sort of a nurturing, like this term that you may have heard me use and others use in the meditation of loving awareness. That there's this infusion of love in the mindfulness, the way that we're meeting the, what's happening with a sacredness like the sacred ordinary even. And so for me, that's important because it, it is a counter to these habitual tendencies of meeting with fear, meeting with um, being afraid of what's gonna happen. And so I wanted to share a bit of a sutta from the Sutta Nipata, which is one of the oldest portions of the Pali Canon. And it's called the Atadanda Sutta. And it's a beautiful sutta. It's sort of written as a verse. Um, and it's almost like poetry. And uh, it shares the voice of someone overcome by despair because of the violence that they see. So I'll read a little bit about it and then I'll share a little bit. I'll share on it. And so the sutta says, fear results from resorting to violence. Just look at how people quarrel and fight. But let me tell you now of the kind of dismay and terror that I have felt. Seeing people struggling like fish, writhing in shallow water with enmity against one another, I became afraid. At one time, I had wanted to find some place where I could take shelter, but I never saw such a place. There is nothing in this world that is solid at base 
and not a part of it that is changeless. And so you may have heard of this image before of people struggling, being like writhing fish in shallow water. It's such a, an image of that struggle that we can see. And yet before the person who's saying this, and one of the things I love about this verse is that it's, um, it's shared from like the first person, like there's an I there, that there's like, it really helped me relate to it. So then he says like, I, you know, seeing people struggling, I have felt afraid. I became afraid. And that sense of like just somebody feeling fear, not only at what's arising, but just at fear at seeing others engaged in violence, seeing others struggling. And I don't know whether that fear is that the person would succumb themselves to that, or the fear is of the violence. And I imagine that each of you may have felt that. I know I have felt both of that, that like I'm going to be pulled in or that I'm gonna, you know, I need to, and then the desire to find something, just anything that could give me that solid ground, you know, something somewhere. And so one of the things that I think that is pointed to at the beginning here is that the people around us and the people in the world are all interconnected. So just by the virtue of this person, you know, who is speaking in this sutta, reflects on how by seeing others and their actions, you know, impacts us. And this is um, one of the definitions for a Buddhist concept of anatta, which is thought of as no self, or also as interconnected, interbeing is the way that Thich Nhat Hanh says it. So we are connected. And to pretend that we could be removed and set aside from what is happening in the world is really a delusion. And so in the sutta, it states, I became afraid. And I think this is so important because naming our fear is such an important step. And the fear can be of death, of injury, global climate change, of getting sick, of our friends getting hurt, or fear can arise from so many things because it's, oh, it feels so like there's no control. And so when that fear happens, we have many choices about what we can do. And it's such an important mindfulness practice to acknowledge what is happening. So if we can say, I am afraid, we can then bring our mindfulness practice into the bottle, body with tenderness and really acknowledge, oh, I'm feeling this way right now. You know, and sometimes when we feel this way, we feel like, oh, I'm, you know, some sense of blame. I shouldn't be, I should be calm. I should be peaceful. Why is this happening to me? And our mindfulness encourages us to just to meet. Well, how is it now? How is it in the body? One of the things that I think is interesting is that so many of the Buddha statues that we, we see, you know, the Buddha is just serene. And, you know, maybe that's because that's the ideal that we want. And I'd like to remember that the first images of the Buddha were, you know, of nature, the lotus, the deer and the wheel, and just the sense of like, it wasn't a person who was non-reactive. It was a growing, living being. And so this is the sense that we will experience all the emotions in our life. And then when we use our mindfulness, we can focus internally and we can focus externally. And so when we can kind of um, pivot between them. And so if something happens externally, we can bring our attention internally and feel like, how is it now? How is it in the body? Where is that landing? How is my heart? And this can attend to that sense of non-separation, our inherent interconnectedness between all of us. 
and as I mentioned, Thich Nhat Hanh calls this interbeing, and he's named the lineage, the order of interbeing. And Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese monk who is, is just very renowned and very prolific writer and a really incredible practitioner. And this is one of the quotes about what he has to say about interbeing. The insight of interbeing will help remove discrimination, fear, and the dualistic way of thinking. We inter are, even suffering and happiness inter are. And that is why the insight of interbeing is the foundation of any kind of action that can bring peace and help remove violence and despair. Here, I can put that in the, um, I probably should have put the suit in there too, but I forgot I can put it in the chat. Um, I love this insight, this way that we can think of like, we can use the sense of interbeing to break down the dualism and that can help bring in peace and violence. And we can remember sort of this interbeing around it. So what is it that I fear and how is that happening? And how am I setting up this dualistic thinking, us and them, and creating an othering? And so I think is we can create, you know, and, and we may feel othered. That's not to say that that doesn't happen. I certainly know that that happens. And I'm always like on the lookout for it. So I can know, like, I know I have a lot of training and being like, oh, you know, where's that going to come? Because the way society has treated me. And I know the more that I can be aware of what's happening, allow it to be in the body, and then not automatically put up all of those boundaries and then walls. And so in the sutta, one of the things that it says is I wanted to find some place where I could take shelter, but I never saw such a place. And, you know, I think this is interesting because I'm always looking for shelter. And one of the places I find a lot of refuge is nature. And I don't think that that's what this sutta is speaking to. I think what the Buddha is speaking to here is the truth of impermanence, that there's no one place that's going to always be solid at the base. And so for us here in California, and you know, I do a lot of walking in nature and the air these days has been really bad. It's nice today, so that's good because of the fires. And so even if I think I'm gonna take shelter in nature, if a fire goes through there, then it's very different. So I may still be feeling some sort of solace, but it's different, it's changing. And so if we're always looking for something to find to be our refuge, you know, it may be, you know, like, oh, I need the new phone, I need a new partner, I need a new job, I need faster internet, you know, and they may provide us some comfort in our lives, but they won't provide us this lasting refuge in this impermanent. As it's still, they're still wrapped up in a place of clinging and craving and looking for something. So in the second noble truth of the Buddha, the Buddha says, you know, that clinging to objects, clinging to ignorance, clinging to views, clinging is what brings suffering. And so the Buddha invites us into this unbinding, train for your own unbinding, train for this sense of blossoming into your full being. And so I think for us to practice with that which is uncomfortable, that which is difficult, that we can pay attention. And I love that this word attend has the word tend in it. Like as we attend to ourself, can we tend? Can we bring in that tenderness? Can we bring in this non-judgmental awareness? And then we have these habit tendencies. So sometimes when we attend, we find these tendencies that 
you know, we have because of the causes and conditions of our lives. And so can we bring our gentle, non-judgmental awareness to all that is arising, to honor the habits that have supported me? And so for me, you know, one of the things that that means is that as a white Dharma teacher at this time, one of the places that I have to attend is how I might be unconsciously or subconsciously or ignorantly perpetuating harm via my privilege. And so I bring that front and center because I know that one of the ways that I might look for comfort, look for refuge, might conflate with areas of privilege and comfort. And so when I remember that there's no refuge, that there's nothing solid, there's nothing lasting, then I might find, investigate some of these areas of comfort, like, oh, comfort in my home. Well, in the US, home ownership, and I don't know the statistics for Canada, but home ownership is predominantly for white people. And home ownership is one of the ways that income inequality is perpetuated because of home ownership being passed from one generation to another. So I can even just take something as simple as like the sense of like, oh, I really need a place to live that's X, Y, and Z and begin to feel how it lands and investigate that through a lens of clinging and where do I take refuge? And then it's not to say that having a home and having a place to land is not something that we want. It's investigating those to see how we might be attaching to it. And are we bringing tenderness and kindness to ourselves in there? And so as I'm finishing up here, this cultivating of tenderness, tenderness with the places even that we may be ignorant. And that once we realize the places that we're ignorant, then we can tend to them even more. And so as we tend, we often end up with these places in the body that we find places that we may feel constriction or expansion or some of the habits of our lives, some of the patterns of our lives are stored in our bodies. And so those are places that we can bring our tenderness to. And we can recognize how the conditions of society have impacted us and turn towards that, you know, to free ourselves. And so I think in the sutta, when the Buddha says, I became afraid, it's not speaking to the desire to have an absence of fear, but to the ability to be in the midst of it all and to recognize, Ooh, I'm afraid. And so actually recognizing that we're afraid, I think can actually be this act of fearlessness. Just being able to be like, Ooh, I'm afraid. And so when we think about fearlessness, one of the favorite um, Buddha statues that I've seen is the Buddha when Buddha stands up and the Buddha has a hand right here. And that's the fearlessness mudra, like where you're like, and I just like, when I see that, I think of that, you know, song like, stop in the name of love, you know, <laughs> Buddha. So I think that that statue, like that statue, I think is really great because it does, it's like a, we're creating a boundary, boom, you know, and we're disrupting the habits and we're recognizing where we are right now and connecting to our heart and connecting to each other and grounding ourselves, not ignoring the discomfort, not trying to get around it, really being with, being with ourselves and being with each other. So I wanna share, finish by sharing a, a kind of a, 
it's a it's from um, Ross Gay, who's a writer, a professor, and a gardener. And uh, this is kind of the way that I think you know when we can kind of investigate things, we can kind of stand them on their heads. And he says, joy has everything to do with the fact that we are going to die. Sometimes I think there's a conception of joy as meaning something easy. And to me, joy has nothing to do with ease and joy has everything to do with the fact that we're going to die. That's actually, he says, when I'm thinking about joy, I'm thinking about that connection being made in life. We are also in the process of dying. If you and I know we're each in the process, there's something that will happen between us. There's some kind of tenderness that might be possible, not always, because I might get scared and do something else, but there's the potential, I think, for some kind of tenderness. And among the things of that thing connecting us is that we have this common experience, many common experiences, but a really foundational one is that we are not here forever. And then as poets do, he said, that's a joining, a joining, J-O-Y-N-I-N-G, joining. So that's sort of how I think about it. I'll copy this and put it in there. And so I love this way that we can actually think about the highs and the lows, the suffering and the joys, and that how they are, oops, not going in there. Sorry, I was trying to put in the chat and it's not doing it. So this way that, you know, this joy has to me, you know, like this, I, I might meet you right there in this tenderness. And then he's, sometimes I might get scared, but if I can meet you in that tenderness of our time here together, we can have a joining, a joining. And so I encourage us all to incline these hearts and minds and bodies towards this tenderness as much as possible so that we can bring the beauty and the joy and live in our full lives and our full being. So thank you for your kind attention. Um, we have some times to open up for discussion and conversation and really to let you know that the wisdom is in the room and that your participation and thoughts are welcomed and essential for our uh, ability to thrive with each other. So we're gonna open it up and I think we should stop the recording um, to do that.